Hello and welcome to our service today at Living Water Christian Outreach. My name is Pastor Dustin Bowden. I am so glad that you chose to join us today for worship. If this is your first time tuning in, we would like to give you a special welcome. You could be doing anything else right now. You could be watching any other videos, but you chose to be with us today. So thank you for that. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to speak into your life today. And it is my hope and prayer that this message would strengthen, edify, encourage you in your walk with the Lord. Here at Living Water, it's our mission to love God, love people, make disciples, and help grow people in godliness. We want to make every effort to make an impact throughout the world with the message of Christ, whether it be in person, here at church, virtually on your phone, tablet, or, or smart TV. It doesn't matter. We want to make the kingdom known. So it is our goal to grow the kingdom of God and to help you to become all that Jesus has created you for. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent us. We must be about our Father's business. So thank you again for joining in today. Be blessed and enjoy the service. Thanks again for joining us today. I pray that this message has...
Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone here this morning. Just some quick announcements and reminders to go over. Um, we just want to thank everybody who helped and um, contributed to the Live Nativity Inquiry yesterday we did up here in town. It was a great time of fellowship and spreading the word of Jesus. So thank you for everybody who helped with that. Give yourselves a round of applause because it was, it was a great time. <laughs> Um, just a reminder, today after church is our church um, Christmas banquet up at the South Tello Community Buildings. We're also taking family pictures. Um, raise your hand if you know how to get to the South Tello Community Building, if you know how to get there. Everybody who do not have their hand raised, look around, find somebody who has their hand raised and say, I'm following you, okay? If, and if you're still not sure, talk to Pastor Dusty or me and we'll get you there. Um, just a reminder, next Sunday after church is the children's Christmas play um, practice. Anybody who's um, all kids have been practicing over in their classes for the Christmas program, please, if you can stay after service next Sunday so we can practice with the kids up on stage, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, also, back on the coat rack, we have a bunch of lost items that's been back there for a while. There's two coats hanging. There's two sunglasses. There's a comb. There's a black wooden serving or plastic wooden sir, plastic black plastic serving spoon. There we go. And um, there's also a coffee mug back there. So please look at the um, lost items back there. If it's yours, please take it because if it's not getting picked up, we're going to be donating them. They just might be door prizes at the Christmas banquet. That's what I was thinking. Amen. We're just going to hand them out. So you might get your own coat back. Uh, at the end of the service today, uh, we're going to ask the congregation to, to come up and, and pray over these. Uh, these, are the, these are the Arizona Christmas boxes that everybody here and many others who maybe are not here provide. Let's try that again. How about that? This is everything that was brought in, the money that came in uh, when Pastor Catherine, and I want to tell this story real quick because, can we fix that, please? Check, check, okay. Uh, whenever, whenever they, in previous years, did the Operation Christmas Child, uh, they had put certain stipulations on her and they pretty much told her she could not give to the same family two years in a row. And she said, how am I supposed to not do that? I live on the reservation. I see the same kids all the time. She says, how am I supposed to skip these kids to give to another community? So they had decided this year that they weren't going to receive from Operation Christmas Child. And a week before uh, I talked to her, they had, the board just said, we'll put this in God's hands and God will provide. God will provide. A couple days later, I called her up because we had been talking here about wanting to do something special for them at Christmas, and she says, you guys are an answer to prayer. You have no idea how much this means to us because we just said, how are we going to get gifts for all these kids? She said, and here are you people from Three Springs, Pennsylvania called and said, we want to provide Christmas. So we put it out, and, and you guys raised, I, I don't know how much exactly, but it was, where's Justin at? Justin in here? Over 3000 You guys brought in over $3,000 and most of the items in here. And so I just want to thank you. I want to thank every one of you for contributing to this. And so these are not average shoe box sizes because that's the first thing Jeff said. Jeff said they look like shoes that maybe Richard could wear would fit in these when he came in. But no, these are double the size of an average shoebox because of the gifts that came in and because of how much we had, we couldn't fit it into a regular shoebox. So these are uh, double the size. And so we're going to bless these. We're going to pray over these. Uh, on Wednesday evening, Wednesday night, it'll be Bridget, myself, and our kids. We're going to be driving to Arizona. We're going to hand deliver these to the church on the reservation. So uh, we're asking for you all to pray for us the entire time. Uh, I get the privilege and the honor of preaching next Sunday again in, in, in Tisto Assembly of God, so I'm excited about that also, so be praying for that. But uh, we're just so thankful for everybody here and everything that you've done, and I know that they feel the same way. So praise God. Elizabeth, will you come open us up? Come on right up here. Psalms 5. 
7 to 8. Because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. I will worship at your temple with deepest awe. Lead me in the right path, O Lord, or my enemies will conquer me. Make your way plain for me to follow. Amen. I just want to finish up with this. In verse 11, it says, But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing joyful praises forever. Spread your protection over them that all who love your name may be filled with joy. For you, bless the godly, O Lord, you surround them with your shield of love. So if you needed a reason to worship this morning, that's your reason. I'd like for you, if you can, to stand this morning. If you can't stand, that's okay. You can worship sitting. You can worship laying down. Your posture of your body does not matter. It's your heart that matters. So let's bow our heads and let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in this day. God, we thank you, Father, that every single day there are brand new mercies. It's brand new, Father, for us to enjoy every single day. God, we gathered here today, Father, because we come in one place that we want to join together and we want to touch heaven today, Father. Father. So, Lord, we're thankful for all that you do for us. Lord, we're thankful, Father, for all that you do for our families. And, God, we pray that this service today, Father, would bless you. God, we pray that our worship would be sweet in your nostrils today, Father, and that you would receive our praise and our honor to you today. Father, we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship God.
Not your fault, Tom. They put all these big Richard boxes in front of us this morning. I don't know. I think I got to do it anyway. Hey. I search your word. But it couldn't fill me And man's empty praise Treasures of fame I'll never enough Well then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Hearing your love Better than you Yes, I know it's true Come on, tell them Oh, and I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My beggars and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me free Cause the God of the mountain. It's the God of the valley. 
There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better. You turn morning to dancing, come on. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, that's the come on, choir. There's power that 
Blessed assurance, Jesus, He is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. The Lord of the Spirit, washed in His blood, and what He did. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. And I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He would never fail. The big submission, all is at rest. And I know the author of tomorrow has ordered my steps. So this is my story. And this is my song. Praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. And I trust in God, my Savior. Trust in God. 
Yes, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Yes, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Yes, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. You know that, don't you, Penny? You know what that's like to seek the Lord and he answers. Her daddy's sitting with us here this morning. It's an answer to prayer. How many days ago was that? Two? Thursday. Thursday. Went in for a pacemaker. Russell, we're so happy to see you here this morning. We're so happy that, that, that you're here. God blessed you. He blessed you, and he, you sought the Lord, and he answered. Tammy, you have a testimony. You have a grandbaby. You sought the Lord, and he answered. Somebody else, who, who sought the Lord, and he answered on your behalf? Raise your hand. Who sought the Lord? How do you trust him with all that you have, with all that you have? He is the same God. He does not change. He is the same God of yesterday, today, and forevermore. Do you trust him? Absolutely. Absolutely. I love hearing things like this when people come and they, and they say, God answered prayer. He always answers prayers, but it's awesome when we get to see the manifestation of it. It is absolutely amazing, and it never ceases to amaze me. He never ceases to amaze me. As Jeff was singing, 
I just kept thinking about this. Different ones of you. I know some of your stories. How you were seeking the Lord. And he heard and he answered. Debbie's got a testimony. Debbie's got a testimony. She sought the Lord and he answered. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I guess we're going to have to move on with our service now. You may be seated this morning. We'll dismiss the children at this time. So thankful for our teachers. So thankful for our children's workers. I thought of a really bad dad joke, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Self-control. <laughs> Amen. I, I'll say this while we're, we're transitioning here. Uh, I had a lot of fun last night. I had a lot of fun last night. How many of you were involved in that? How many of you had a blast? I, I looked over at one point and I said to Sharon, and I said, this is easier than the Fulton County Fair. Said, All we got to do is sit here and smile. I had a lot of fun. And, and that was so much, it, it was like... It, it just couldn't have went together more, more perfectly. Mm. You know, we put this before God, and then we did the live nativity, and uh, it, it was amazing. There was people in front of us all evening, and, and as I was, I was sitting there, I was just watching people. They're just coming up, and they're just taking it all in. They're just taking it all in. They, they just, uh, in my mind, I'll be, I'll be truthful. I'm watching groups of people stand there for 20 and 30 minutes just, just watching and I'm thinking, would I stand there for 20 to 30 minutes? You know, well, I'm the type of person I go and I do what I got to do and I get going. I go do something else. But they were just standing around taking it in. And I, I want to say this also. I'm thankful for Bridget. Uh, Bridget put a lot of that, a lot of the thoughts into organization and scheduling. And, and I told her last night, I said, if you wouldn't have been there, I said, I don't think this would have worked. I said, it, and she just had everything right down to the T, what you needed to do, when you needed to do it. And. You know, and, and the only thing I contributed was, was myself and a stable and everything else. You guys did the rest. And I'm just so thankful for all of you. I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun. And so they want to, I think they're going to want to do it again next year. And so now we begin to pray for a nice day again because that was beautiful weather. It was beautiful weather. So, all right, praise God. I think everybody's done moving now. So today we have with us. Pastor Jess, Evangelist Jessica, uh, she's not a stranger to anybody here. Actually, most of the time when you leave, everybody asks, when's she coming back? You know, and so, so can we give her a warm welcome this morning? Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Dusty, for having me back again. And if you don't mind, I'll just speak from right here, if that's good with everybody today. And it's good to be back at Living Water Christian Outreach. Amen. How many can say it's good to be in God's house? Amen. Amen. It's good to be in God's house. Well, before I get started, um, like I said, thank you, Pastor Dusty, for having me. And I brought along with me just some prayer cards, as I normally do. Um, so if you don't mind, before you leave here today, grab one of these cards. They're free to you. And they do a lot and mean a lot to me. I covet your prayers. How many understand when you're in ministry, such as your pastor or evangelist or you're a missionary, right? We, are, we, we need prayers. We need prayers for protection. We need prayers for our family. And so traveling like I do, I would ask that you would remember my children, Frankie Knox and Colt in prayer, my husband Frank in prayer, and myself as I travel and minister the word of God. And so I thank you in advance for that. And uh, I, I know that, um, man, God moves on behalf of your prayers. And so I thank you today for that. How many would say you love Pennsylvania? Anybody in the room? I love Pennsylvania. Three of you love Pennsylvania. How many love Pennsylvania, right? You know, I can tell you I love Pennsylvania. I was born and raised here. I can say all except for one year. My dad uh, just retired from about 40 years of pastoral ministry. So the majority of that time, 39 uh, years of his ministry out of the 40, um, were all spent here in Pennsylvania. For the past 15 years, my husband and I have lived in the south central part of the state, right? We 
live in Chambersburg. How many are familiar with the big metropolis of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania? You know, it, it's kind of like here. It's characteristically, right, more rural with, uh, you know, it's country roads that are surrounded by farmland. You know, traveling a good portion of the country, I can say truly at this point, I relate very strongly with the statement, there's no place like home. I would say there's no place like home. And so I love it. We love it. More recently, Chambersburg got uh, a rural king. How many know what a rural king is, right? Yes. Uh, right. If you're unfamiliar, it's a farm equipment supply store. You know, you could kind of loosely compare it to a tractor supply. However, my husband, and if you'd ask our three boys, they would argue that there's one crucial distinction that sets Rural King apart from all of the competition. And no, it's not the quality of their farm equipment, right? It's not the home decor uh, and the variety of their boots, but rather I would tell you it's the free popcorn. How many can say amen, right, for free popcorn? You know, my children, they love popcorn. And uh, more recently, we took them to the movie theaters, and I'm not endorsing that, right? I grew up in the era. My dad would let us go to the movie theater, but he told us we couldn't tell grandma and grandpa, okay? So, you know, <laughs> we took our kids to the movie theater, and this is a special treat for us. Uh, we took them to see the movie Super Mario Brothers. Anybody in the room see that movie, Super Mario, a couple of you? Uh, you know, as we were standing there, I was like, we're going to make this an event because it never happens. And so we caved and we told them, listen, we're going to let you guys get some popcorn, right? And so as I watched them, what I realized in this moment is that my children were more excited about the possibility of downing buckets of popcorn than they were about watching the actual movie. You know, I'm sure there are some of you in here like myself that can say, Popcorn, I can take it or leave it, right? Right? Uh, I'm more of a corn on the cob fan. Anybody else in the room? Yeah? Like, I can't, I, as I was writing this message, I began to think, I was like, you know, really, I've got a suggestion for movie theaters. Now, hear me out. I feel like they should make as an alternative to popcorn, corn on the cob, right? The salt and the butter, it's already there. And I feel like I'm not the only one in the room, right, that feels this way today. But on a more serious note, like typically more summers, more, more, th more likely than not most summers, I plant a garden. Any gardeners in the room? You know, I love to garden. There's just something about that. You know, this year I had three helpers. Uh, I don't know if they hindered or helped, but they were there, right? I moved the dirt around, and our three boys, I placed in each of their hand, right, a corn seed. And they began to put those little seeds into the dirt, and I just began to talk to them about how these tiny little kernels of corn, right? We're going to eventually, right, push up like shoots through the ground and, and become these massive corn stalks that we're going to produce multiple ears of corn. I would watch regularly throughout the summertime as our three boys, they would race out to the garden and, and they, would, they would begin to look for the growth that was occurring. One particular day kind of stands out in my mind as they raced out to our garden and I watched them and they're nine, seven, and five years old, and I looked as they were standing in amazement. They were looking up at these corn stalks, right? There were once these tiny little seeds, and they realized that they were now taller than they were. It just so happened that that same night, a massive storm kind of blew through our area. There was some intense rain and, and wind that blew through. So naturally, the next morning, I, I got up, and uh, I went out to look at our garden and to kind of see, all, like, what damage had occurred. I went out to our garden, and I realized that, you know, there had been some damage that had severely done, some, done a number on those corn stalks. As I got closer, I couldn't believe my eyes as I witnessed that there was not one single corn stalk left standing. You know, just... 24 hours earlier, they were once these thriving and flourishing stalks of corn. And now, in this next moment, right, that I was standing there, they looked seemingly demolished. They looked as if there was no hope that they could possibly produce anything, especially not anything good. You know, as I stood there in that moment, I have to tell you, it, it, I felt like the Holy Spirit kind of redirected me because I was standing there and I looked at this and I thought, man, there was so much work that went into this. There was so much progress that had been made. And I felt like in this moment, I'll be honest, I thought, what a waste, right? Like, what a waste of time. What a waste of effort. And as I stood there, I felt like the Holy Spirit just kind of remind me of the Israelites. 
And it kind of brought me back to the book of Judges as I, I was sitting there. I don't know, there's something special about the garden because I can tell you oftentimes when I'm in those quiet moments, I feel like the Holy Spirit just kind of speaks to my heart. And as I was standing there, you know, I pondered this and I was reminded of all the progress that was made right by the Israelites under the leadership of Joshua. And as, as how they entered, right, the promised land, we understand that as they walked in faithful obedience to God, right, in return, God faithfully laid every single enemy at Israel's feet. But yet in the matter of one generation, what seems to be like a blink of an eye, we see Israel, right, they move from blessing to oppression, don't they? They move from standing in victory to lying in defeat as Judges chapter 2, and I invite you to turn there with me this morning, reading from the New Living Translation, starting at verse 10, reading through 17, says this. Judges 2, starting at verse 10. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. Verse 12. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people around them, and they angered the Lord. They abandoned the Lord to serve Baal and the images of Ashtoreth. This made the Lord burn with anger against Israel, so he handed them over to raiders who stole their possessions he turned them over to their enemies all around, and they were no longer able to resist them. Every time Israel went out to battle, the Lord fought against them, causing them to be defeated just as he had warned. And the people were in great distress. Verse 16, then the Lord raised up judges to rescue the Israelites from their attackers. Yet Israel did not listen to the judges, but prostituted themselves by worshiping other gods. How quickly they turned away from the path of their ancestors who had walked in obedience to the Lord's commands. As you read this passage of scripture, it's clear that the transformation that occurred and that's recorded in the matter of one generation, it's startling. And it's really eye-opening to say the least. It speaks so strongly to the importance of faithful obedience to God in every area of our life. And the impact that takes place, right, if there is a lack of faithfulness, not just in the present moment, but for future generations. The Joshua generation is described as a people who served the Lord, who had seen the mighty ways in which he moved on behalf of Israel and throughout its history, and who had walked in faithful obedience to the Lord's commands. And yet what we see is that the ensuing, the resulting generation, the generation that came after the Joshua generation, they grew up, and Scripture says they did not acknowledge the Lord. That word, right, in the most basic form means they did not know the Lord. They had no real relationship or connection with the Lord. And they did not remember the mighty ways in which he had moved on behalf of the nation of Israel and its history. Scripture tells us that they grew up and they did evil in the Lord's sight. They served these images of Baal and Ashtoreth, and the Lord had abandoned them. Throughout the book of Judges, we see several things, but three truths strongly stand out to me. The first is this, God's clear commission. God is clear in his commission because he knows the persuasiveness of the enemy. I want you to understand something today, that God is very clear in his commission and his direction because he understands the enemy's persuasiveness. How many know that the enemy is very persuasive? You can see it throughout our world. You don't have to look very hard or very far. You know, Moses had been commissioned by God to instruct the people of Israel. He had been commissioned by God to exhort the people of Israel to love God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, and with all of their strength. Right, you read this in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and specifically Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, right? We're told that Moses looks at all of the Israelites and he says this, you are to love God with the totality of your being. We understand that Deuteronomy 6, right, is, is where the Shema is, which is also, right, the, where the Jewish people, they still recite this, right, is one of their essential creeds. 
We have to understand that Moses, he's looking at the, the nation of Israel and he's telling them, listen, it's so important that you love God with everything that you are. How many understand today that when we love God with everything that we are, that there are certain parts of us, right, that say, yes, it's easy for me to love God in this way, in this area of my life. I mean, see, there are areas where it's easy for you to comply. There are other areas of your heart and of our lives, right, that it's a little more challenging, where maybe that sinful nature doesn't want to align, right, to love God and walk in obedience to him. And here Moses is saying, listen, you have to love God with everything that you are in the areas right where it comes naturally, in the areas where it's very difficult. I'm here to tell you today, church, that the mission, the commission is still the same. We are to love God with the entirety of our being, with every area of our life, the areas where it's easy for us and the areas where we are challenged in. We are to love God with the totality of our person. You see, Israel was to be a people that was not only characterized simply by this, these outward rituals, Right, But they were to be a people that were defined by this inward, authentic love and devotion to Yahweh that would direct their reality. How many understand, church? I even believe that's a word for the church today. That so many times, right, we can get caught up in the, the rituals and the religiosity, right, that can come with being a Christian and a follower of Christ, right? And it's important to, I believe, come to the house of God and, and apply these certain things into our lives. But we have to understand that they must be directed by this inward, authentic love and devotion for God that sets us apart. And so here Moses, he says, love God with everything that you are. This should be incorporated to every facet of your lives. But there was great importance placed upon raising the next generation to do the same. You see, this was to be a united effort. So as Moses speaks to the Israelites, he's saying, listen, you're to love God in every area. And there's great importance placed on raising the next generation. You know, when Moses is speaking to the Israelites, he's not just speaking, although it definitely includes parents. I mean, no, as Moses is speaking to the Israelites, he's talking to mothers and fathers. He's talking to grandparents. But you have to understand, he is speaking to every adult Israelite that is in covenant relationship with God. He's saying this is to be a united effort. You are to work together to raise the next generation, right, to love God by taking advantage of every opportunity, whether in public or in private through spoken and through unspoken means, to cultivate in the next generation a deep love for, an authentic desire to serve God, right? That would determine their thoughts, that would direct their actions and to an unwavering allegiance to Yahweh. You see, Moses understood that the greatness of the nation of Israel was heavily tied to one generation pouring into the next. I believe that today we look at our world in which we live, the greatness of the nation, of, right, of the United States is heavily tied to, right, covenant people pouring into the next generation. You see, the Israelites were given this commission. The Joshua generation had personally and powerfully experienced so much of God in their lifetime. How many in this room can say, man, I have personally experienced God's goodness how many in the room can say that? God's greatness, his faithfulness to me in my lifetime. And here Israel, right, this Joshua generation had experienced this. They have experienced the parting, right, of the Jordan River, the sun standing still, the walls of Jericho collapsing, understanding. And yet the, the reality was somehow along the way, they failed to effectively communicate the connection between, right, the greatness of their thriving history and that connection as a people consecrated to the living God. The great tragedy of the Joshua generation, hear me, was not that they did not know God, was not that they did not experience God, but rather that they did, only to leave behind a generation who did not know God or remember the mighty things he had done. You know, this hit me very hardly because I have three young boys living in my home. You know, the succeeding generation did not have a personal experience with God. I mean, you know, it's so important that you and I cultivate opportunities for the next generation to have a personal 
experience with God. You know, and so naturally what comes natural to sinful nature is the next generation did evil in the Lord's sight. You see, God had commanded the Joshua generation not only to raise the next generation, right? But he had also commissioned them and commanded them to remove all of the pagan inhabitants and to destroy all the altars when they entered the promised land. How many in here have ever rationalized disobedience to God? Maybe just me. (laughs) How many have ever rationalized disobedience, right? We understand that rationalizing sin, and let's call it for what it is, because the reality is partial obedience to God is full disobedience. Right? Right? Partial obedience to God is full disobedience. You see, Israel, as they entered the promised land, the Joshua generation, they began to rationalize, right, their disobedience. They began to say things like, think to themselves, well, do we really have to rid rid the land of all of the pagan inhabitants? Because they began to think to themselves, well, we could utilize, right, the pagans, the Canaanites that remain, and we can enlist them as slaves, and they can work for us. This can be a good thing. How many know the enemy is very good at causing us to rationalize sin that only later leads to regret and heartache? And so in this moment, we understand that they allowed some of the Canaanite traces to remain. And in chapter 3 of the book of Judges, we're told that eventually the next generation lived among the pagans. Scripture tells us that they went even farther. They began to intermarry. It's this picture of assimilation. I want you to understand the Israelites were a covenant people that were supposed to, that were at one point, right, a distinct nation. They were a covenant people committed to Yahweh. And in the matter of one generation, they became indistinguishable from the pagans that they lived, that they allowed to live among them. There was no difference between Israel and and the pagans that they allowed to remain in the land. Israel was now not just allowing the enemy to live among them, but Israel was just like them, worshiping at the very altars that God had commanded to be a pile of rubble. You see, the Joshua generation's failure to remove resulted in the next generation not only allowing for the enemy to remain, but now resembling the enemy. Such a stark contrast in the matter of one generation. We see the important role that parents in the present generation plays into the next and the great tragedy that occurs when that role is lacking. You know, in such a short period of time, a nation once defined by their love and allegiance for God had completely abandoned him. You know, when I think about this, you know, I I remember standing there at my garden and looking at all of the corn stalks knocked over, right? And I, as I said already, like, I thought, what a waste. And I began to think things like, man, is there any hope that this garden, like, there's no possible way that this garden is going to produce anything. There's no hope for this. I have to think that there might be some of you like me in the room that have ta- that there have been times throughout your life where you've looked at the, the next generation. Have you looked at things coming down the pike and you've said things like, is there any hope for the next generation? I mean, in the room besides me. Maybe you've looked at, at our world and thought, man, there's, there's no hope. There's no way anything good can come of this. I want to encourage you today that there is always hope because of Jesus Christ, right? There is always hope. We understand that you and I are the answer, that God has still and is still commissioning us, the present generation, right, to make a difference. When he says in Matthew 28, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we are to teach, we are to impart these new disciples. I want you to understand every father, every mother, every grandparent, every adult that's in covenant relationship with God. You are commissioned to raise, and it starts in the home, to disciple the next generation, to have an unwavering allegiance to God and for Yahweh that will direct their emotions and determine their steps. The great promise is this. We don't do it alone. Aren't you thankful for the gift of the Holy Spirit? Because we don't do it alone. You know, my personal prayer is this, as a, as a mother, as a minister, that as I yield to the Holy Spirit's work in my life, that I will regularly testify of God's goodness and faithfulness in my lifetime. 
that I will cultivate opportunities for the next generation to know and experience God that I will regularly de declare the truths that are unwavering, that are found in Scripture, that are steadfast, right, that do not shift with ever-changing culture, that I will model a lifestyle of unwavering and authentic allegiance to God, not just in the public arenas. I, I do, I travel, and I get to speak to a lot of people, but God help me that my children never look at their mother and say this, man, she was one person in public, but another person in private. I pray that I model a life of unwavering obedience to God, that who I was on the platform is who I was in the private arenas of my life, that I will model for them uh, through unspoken and spoken means the goodness of God so that the next generation and my children might serve the Lord, might see the mighty ways in which he works and walk in faithful obedience to God all the days of their life. You know, and I pray that whatever it is that God has asked me to remove out of my life, regardless of what my finite thinking could rationalize, that I would grab it by the root. How many understand that we look at the nation of Israel and we understand that because the previous generation rationalized sin, it became the very wellspring of heartache for the next generation. Hear me today, whatever it is that God is calling you parent calling you father, calling you mother, calling you believer to remove out of your life. If the Bible calls it sin, don't rationalize sin. Grab it by the root and remove it because it will become the very wellspring of uh, root of heartache for your children, for your grandchildren, for the next generation. How many are willing to say today, I want my children, I want this next generation to walk in freedom. And if I have to remove whatever it is, no matter how uncomfortable, I want to rid it from my life so they might walk in freedom because what I fail to eliminate today, what I entertain today, right, the next generation will embrace tomorrow. The choices you and I make, the degree of seriousness we take in raising and removing not only impacts our present, but directs the future. You see, the enemy is very persuasive, and we must do everything we can as we lean on the Holy Spirit that those coming behind us might know God, serve him, and walk in faithful obedience to him. You see, throughout the, both the Old and the New Testament, we see that God is constant in character, right? Despite our sinful propensity. Aren't you thankful that God is constant in his character? Despite our sinful propensity? You know, I hear a lot of people speak, and there are certain, I, I don't even like to use the word famous, because as my dad said, and I love this, he posted it on Facebook, he said, you know, we're not building our brand, we represent God's. Right. How many understand, as a minister of the gospel, that's my heart. It's not about my ministry. It's not about my face, right? I'm, I'm here to share Jesus Christ. But there's a lot of what the world would deem as famous preachers or evangelists or ministers who would say that the Old Testament isn't necessary. I'm here to tell you today that the Old Testament paints a beautiful picture, right, for why the New Testament, right? We understand that there is a need for both, and the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. We understand, right, that although there was an Old Covenant, now there's a New Covenant. There is still a God, right, who is constant in his character, right, despite our sinful propensity. You know, it's been said that failing to learn from history usually results in the reliving of its lessons. You see, this was Israel's problem, wasn't it? That they failed to learn, right, from their mistakes. As you read the book of Judges, what you understand is there's like this cyclical pattern, right? Many scholars would say this. There's a cyclical pattern. There's a cycle that takes place, right? Israel abandons the Lord, right? He, he allow, the Lord allows them to become oppressed by the enemy. He raises up judges, right? They cry out to him. He raises up judges. The judge dies, right? They fall back into this cycle of sin. But really, as the, although it's like this cycle, right? What you have to understand is with every cycle, they go deeper and deeper into sin, how many can say you can kind of see that in our world today, right? It's like you see this cycle of sin, but every, every generation it seems like it goes deeper and deeper right into sin and into idolatry. I don't know about you, but as a parent I can say this, that there are sometimes, right, my kids tend to do the same things over and over again, and it gets them in trouble over and over again, right? How many can relate to that? It's like, you know, why are we doing this again? 
right? It's like you just kind of want to take your head and like bang it, right? Because you're like, you know, your kids, you're like, there's not, like, right, there's not going to be a different outcome. This is still going to be unpleasant for you, right? And you look at Israel, and it's like the same thing. You feel like God's looking at Israel, and you're like, man, he has to be like, come on. Like, when are we going to get this, that this isn't going to end well? There's this cyclical pattern, right? And they go deeper and deeper into sin. And it kind of shapes the book of Judges, this next generation. And because Israel abandoned the Lord, Scripture tells us that God, he hands them over to their oppressors. And Scripture goes on to say he actively fought against them. He enacts penalty. I mean, understand, we look at God's character and we understand that we like the, we like the blessing part of God, right? But how many know that, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, right, God disciplines those he loves. And you look at this and we understand that it's important to understand that God's anger should not be defined or characterized like our human anger. How many have ever gotten angry before? Yeah, okay, I got a lot of response on that. Everyone's like, yes, right? Gotten angry before. How many understand that our human anger is often characterized, right, by this vindictiveness and spitefulness, right? But we have to understand God's anger is not like our human anger. It's based and it comes from this possessive, righteous love that says, listen, I'm going to do whatever I have to do if that means discipline, right, to get your wholehearted allegiance back. I'm going to do whatever it takes, right, to turn your heart back to repentance. It's never vindictive. It's all about restoration of covenant relationship. And yet we see that the character of God, although he's just, right, he is also this example of perfect patience, Aren't you thankful for a father, right, who is so long-suffering and so patient? You know, we look at Israel, and although you and I in our human nature, right, even probably with our own children, would be extremely frustrated, and maybe our anger wouldn't always come from this righteous place, right? How many parents have said, I've gotten mad at my child, and it always hasn't been righteous, right? And, uh, you know, this, this feeling... But we understand that God's, God is righteous, it's a possessive love, but he's also this example of patience and long-suffering. And we see it through the gift of the judges. How many know that God didn't have to give Israel the judges that would lead them out and rescue them from their oppression? But God looks at Israel and he provides them with judges who would lead them back and out and rescue them from their enemies in spite of their sinful tendency. The humbling truth is that God knew Israel would continue to repeatedly sin, and yet he provides them over and over again with the gift of judges. I'm so thankful for this long-suffering God that says this, that even though Israel was so inconsistent in their commitment to covenant, right, God was so consistent. He remained constant even in their inconsistency. I'm here to tell you today that maybe you've been struggling, this isn't in my notes, but you've been struggling in certain areas of your life, right, to walk in faithful obedience. Maybe you're sitting in this room and you're like, I've been very inconsistent in my walk with the Lord. I'm here to tell you God does use discipline, right, unpleasant things to bring us back. But I also want you to understand that God remains so committed and so constant, right, to you, even in your inconsistency. That God is a God of love, and this love is defined. It's who he is. Everything he does concerning us flows from who he is. Whether it's discipline or blessing, it flows from who he is. He loves us enough to discipline us. You see, it's the commission, not our comfort. I want you to hear that today. You know, he's commissioned us. It's the commission to go and make disciples, not our comfort. It's our holiness, not our happiness. How many are hearing this today? We live in America where everybody wants to be happy. God's more concerned with your holiness. Right. You know, it, it's your purity, not your pleasure. Right. I mean, that's an unpopular idea in today's culture. I would say even in the modern day church, it's the commission, not your comfort. It's your holiness, not your happiness. And it's your purity, not your pleasure, that is most important to God. And he will use discipline to bring us back. And yet what we see is although he's possessive for us, 
He's patient with us. And the demands of the new covenant, I don't believe, are any less stringent, right, than the old in the, term, in the sense that God is still after our fidelity. God is after your fidelity. That means your faithfulness. God desires your full, unwavering allegiance. And finally, one scholar put it this way. The greatest battle in the book is that fought by Yahweh for the wholehearted allegiance of his people. God is committed to covenant, warring for his possession. If keys would just, Jeff, if you would come, just play lightly on the keys at this time. You know, although without question there was a parental and I would even say present generation responsibility, the next generation was personally answerable or accountable. So for every young person sitting in this room, I want you to understand there's a two folds to this. There's, there's two sides, two components. The present generation, and you can look around, we'll say those 30 and above, right, just because, right, I feel like, I don't know, everybody wants to be a youth until 30, right, <laughs> anymore. So I'm 36, so I'm not saying that for me. <laughs> understand this, that, yes, your parents your pastors, the adults that are claiming to be in covenant relationship with God, young people, they have a present generation responsibility to you to model a life of unwavering obedience, to raise you and to remove things out of their life that are not in line with the word of God. But hear me, next generation, you are personally answerable before God. So in spite of what they do, one day you will stand before God, not with your mom, not with your dad, not with your pastor, but you're going to stand before God and you're going to answer for who you've made Jesus Christ to be in your life. There's a personal accountability. You see, the land promised to the fathers had not come into secure possession because of Israel's repeated apostasy. They refused to comply with their end of the covenant. But how many understand? So uh, God desired to expand Israel's borders, right? But that plan was at a stalemate, right? Because Israel failed to comply with their end of the covenant. It wasn't that God wasn't faithful. It was that Israel was not faithful. God has no grandchildren. I mean, no, Israel was fine with the blessings of God. How many understand that? Israel wanted, right? They wanted to walk in freedom. They didn't want to live in oppression. They wanted to walk in victory, right, over their enemies. But how many know they weren't willing at this point to be obedient to God? The reason that the Joshua generation had every enemy lied at their, laid at their feet was because they walked in faithful obedience. Maybe there's some of you in this room and you're saying, man, I just feel like, I, you know, life is so hard that I can't walk in freedom. And I'm not talking about freedom from hardship, but I'm talking about even in your spirit, you feel so oppressed. I'm hear me today. You want to have freedom. You've got to surrender everything to Jesus. We live in a world where we're saying, man, we want the blessings, right? But we don't want to have to deal with the obedience part. You want the blessing. Blessing follows obedience. And hear me, God has no grandchildren. You don't inherit a relationship with God. That's personal. The next generation couldn't inherit, right? That experience, it had to be personal. You see, the Canaanite traces that were allowed to remain, God used to train Israel in warfare, to let them understand what it would look like. He gave them the opportunity to know him, to understand their need for him. You know, this is even a word for some of you parents in here. Maybe you did everything you could, to raise your child, right, into the things of God. Man, I'm here to tell you, there's no perfect parent on this planet, starting with me. So if you're in here and you're saying, man, well, I made mistakes, I tried my best with the help of the Holy Spirit, I want you to walk out of here with freedom today, knowing that the guideline is train up a child in the way they should go, right, and when they're older, they won't depart from it. It's a guideline, it's not a guarantee because of this element of free will. So walk out of here in freedom today, knowing that if you did your part, right, trust God for the rest. But you understand that as Israel
Israel, right, they, they wanted the freedom. They wanted to walk in freedom, not defeat. How many in this room say, I want to walk in freedom, right? We'll try that again. Because if you don't want to walk in freedom, that means you want to walk in bondage. I don't think there's anybody. How many want to walk in freedom? You want to live in freedom, right? Israel wanted that, right? And God used, right, the enemy, right, to allow them to experience, to know him, to give them the opportunity to realize their great need for him. But freedom and free will, right, are not the same. How many know that each one of us in this room has free will, right? God gives us that. Free will. But how many know that you all have free will, but not all of you are walking in freedom? Those are two different things, right? Israel had free will. They could choose, right, to walk in obedience or they could choose to live like the pagans. And when they chose the pagan way of life, they were living in oppression. When they walked in obedience, they could live in freedom. God desired to give Israel victory, but their future would depend on their response. You see, he is never so interested in solving our problems as he is in solidifying our relationship to him. Each present generation has a great responsibility, but the buck ultimately stops with the next generation. You are personally accountable before God. You know, as I think about this, and as I prepare just to kind of bring it to an altar moment, as I stood there just kind of looking at these corn stalks, right? As I stood there like looking at these corn stalks laid all over, I began to think to myself, what a waste. And then I thought, you know what? No, they're going to do what I want them to do. How many control freaks in the room? Anybody besides myself, right? Like they're going to they're going to stand up and they're going to do what I want them to do. And so my initial reaction, right, was to go to Rural King, where I actually got this movie popcorn bucket, right? Go to Rural King, and I was going to get like some sticks or some bamboo or whatever steaks, and I was going to buy however many I needed, and I was going to you know, put them in the ground, take some twine and wrap it around and make them stand up. So before I, before I did that, right, I thought, you know, I'm going to go to somebody that's a little wiser. How many in the room are thankful for people that are wiser, smarter, better looking, right? All of those things, right? And I was like, I'm going to call somebody that's a little more versed in this. So I called this woman by the name, her name's Karen, and uh, she plants corn every year. And I called her and I said, hey, Karen, this is the situation. This is what I'm thinking about doing. And I was hoping she was going to say, wow, you're so smart. Do that. She goes, don't do that. And uh, she said, what I want you to do is do nothing. I'm in the room, when you're a fixer, right, you're like, do nothing, right? That's not going to work for me, right? She's like, do nothing. She goes, I want you to watch because as the sun comes out each day, those corn stalks are eventually, as they look at the sun, going to raise back up to life. I'll be honest, in my heart, you know what I thought? You're crazy. (laughs) I didn't tell her that. (laughs) I I was like, okay, thank you. And I hung up the phone and I love her. She'd be okay if she were sitting here, me saying that. And um, so every day I would get out my cell phone. My husband busted me one day. I was like, it's 7.20 a.m. And I was like, the corn stalks are laying flat. There they are. And then I'd come out a day later, and I'm like, 24 hours later, the state of the corn stalks. My husband's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm going to make a YouTube video for somebody else. So anyway, you can look at this next picture here. I think I have it on here. So that one is, a, and then, no joke, by day seven, that's how they were, standing completely back up to life. And I had multiple, multiple ears of corn that had been producing. So for the parent in here, you're praying, you know what, for your kid, let them experience what it is to lie in defeat and just keep praying for them. Because the moment that they look towards the sun, Jesus Christ, that's who raises them back up to life. When you can realize your great need for him. Maybe you're sitting in this room today, and I pray for the conviction of the Holy Spirit all over this place. I always pray for four things. Clarity of words, you know, clarity of mind, crispness of words, compassion of heart, and conviction of the Holy Spirit. And so I pray that you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit because it's going to flow from God's love for you today that maybe you feel like you're knocked over, you're living in oppression, you're living in defeat, 
you know, you keep trying to do things in your own strength. And I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today to say this. If you would just look at Jesus, if you would just surrender your life, I can take you from where you are now, laying in defeat, to standing up in victory, to producing things you never thought possible, to looking at your life and saying, is there any hope? Is there anything good that can come from this? And God is saying, if you would surrender it to me and look to me, I'm going to take you from where you are now, and I'm going to allow you to experience Experience what I can do in and through you only in the sun. With every head bowed and every eye closed, you're sitting in this room today and you're just saying this, I have never truly surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. I've never truly experienced Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would begin to convict, that your love, Lord God, would lead people to repentance. You're in this room today, just through a raise of hand, right where you are, you're just saying, I'm willing to surrender today. I don't want to walk out of here the way I walked in here. I want to experience victory. I see that hand in the back. Anybody else? I see those hands over there. I see that hand there today. Anybody else today? You're saying, I'm willing to surrender today. I'm, I see that hand there. I'm not doing this anymore in my own strength. I see that hand over there. Anybody else today? I see that hand there. Anybody else today? You're just saying, I see that hand there. I see that hand there, there, there. I'm going to invite you, if you've raised your hand today, I'm already standing. If you just stand right where you are, you're saying, I'm serious about this today. I'm just going to stand. I'm saying, I'm not doing this. Let the devil know I'm not doing this today. You're going to stand to your feet today as a sign of your commitment standing. Yes. Today I'm standing. There's something, there's something about moving our body. I believe all of hell, right, is recognizing this moment here. I believe even in the spiritual, right, there's chains that are just going to begin to fall in this place. I'm going to invite you to do what I, what I do regularly. I'm going to invite you just to take your hands, if you will. I do this everywhere I go. Hands raised to the sky. I'm going to invite you. This is a universal sign of surrender. I mean, you go anywhere in the world, your hands are up. They know I'm surrendering. You're standing. I'm surrendering today. This is your sign where you're saying, God, I'm surrendering to you. I surrender to you. I give up trying to do it in my own strength. I give up trying to do it in my own, my own might. I, I'm done rationalizing sin. I'm done rationalizing why, you know, I, I'm not operating in full obedience. But today I want to surrender to God and I claim the blood of Jesus Christ today. I'm going to say this prayer. This prayer does not save you. The Bible tells us it's what we believe in our heart and what we confess with our mouth. So if you believe Jesus Christ came to this earth as a baby, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for your sin, rose again from that grave, never to die again, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and you're saying, I believe those things, I believe he's coming back again, and I'm ready to surrender, we're going to say this prayer. You can either repeat after me or say it in your own words. Say, dear Jesus, I surrender. I give you all of my shame. I give you all of my guilt today. And I accept your gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. I claim the blood of Jesus over my life. I'm done doing things my own way. I give you control. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Finally, I'm going to invite every Christian in this place. You know Jesus, every adult, so we'll just say, let's lower it a little bit, 25 and older. I'm going to invite you just to stand right where you are. If you're a Christian in this place, 25 and older, you're saying, I believe in Jesus. I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior. You're 25 and older. Sorry, we bumped it back five years. So 25 and older. If that's you today and you're saying this, you're saying, I'm going to stand so you can see me. I am committed to raising the next generation. And I'm committed to removing whatever it is God calls me to remove for the sake of not only myself, the present, but for the future. If that's you, I'm going to invite you just to kind of line yourselves up just along the front. You're 25 and older. I know this is a big room, so if you need to line yourselves along the wall, we're just going to kind of make a circle. I'm going to want you to face this way is what I want you to do. So back, yep, face this way. You're 25 and older. I'm going to invite you just to line yourself up. We're going to face around this room. Yep. 
real quickly, if you're able, if you're not able to walk, please stay where you are. Please stay where you are. There's a lot of you, right? Don't you have a good pastor? Amen. So here it is. So here, we've got some of you in the seats, right? You're saying you're under 25 or you're incapable of coming forward. I want you young people that are in these pews, right, and there's some back there, to look at them, and they're acknowledging that they have a responsibility to you. Right? That's what we're acknowledging today. We have a responsibility to you to show you what it looks like, myself included, how to love Jesus, and to model a life, right, both in public and in private, what it looks like to be a faithful follower. Now hear me today. You that are in your seats, you are one day going to be answerable to God. You might say, well, my parents aren't perfect. I'm telling you, I'm not perfect. You could say your pastor's not perfect. That's okay. One day you're going to stand before God and you've got to make a choice for who you're going to make Jesus Christ to be to you. But how many can say today, we want to give them a good example to follow? And so we're going to pray for them. I invite you just to extend your hands towards these young ones sitting in this room and the ones that are in the back. And I'm going to say a prayer, and you can pray for them too right where you are. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this church. God, I thank you, God, for the wonderful examples, Lord God, that this church is being and is going to continue to be, and even in a greater way, be to this next generation. God, I pray that they would model, God, a life of unwavering allegiance to God, both in the public and private arenas, that they would model it through spoken and unspoken uh, means, Lord, that they would testify of your goodness all the days of their life. God, and I pray, God, for every parent in this room that has a child that is wayward, that is not serving God. God, I pray, God, right now you would seize their heart. God, right where they're at, every burden of every father and mother, Lord, that keeps them awake at night as they pray, God, for the salvation of their child that they've raised. God, I pray, God, that they would see, God, very soon, God, even right now, their child look to you and be raised back to life through Jesus Christ. God, we claim that today. And God, I pray for every young person sitting in this room, God, that they would choose you, that they would know you, they would see the way you've worked, that they would serve you and walk in faithful obedience to you all the days of their lives. God, I pray even out of this group that's in this room, you'd, you'd rise up pastors, you'd rise up evangelists, you'd rise up missionaries, Lord God, as we fulfill the commission that you've called us to fulfill. God, let us raise the next generation to love you, to honor you, God, and to serve you all the days of their lives. God, I pray for Pastor Dusty. If we could just turn right here as Pastor Dusty and his family. We're just going to quick, because that's how I'm going to close out. God, I pray you can lay your hands. God, for Pastor Dusty. God, I pray for his family. I thank you for Bridget. God, I thank you for his three beautiful daughters. God, I pray, God, as he leads this church, God, as God, as, as he's really, God, in battle, God, for souls today. Lord, the shepherd of this church, God, I pray you'd give him wisdom, Lord God, beyond all human means. Lord, I pray for divine wisdom today. God, I pray, God, for continued words of, of knowledge and wisdom. God, prophetic words, Lord Jesus. God, I pray, God, for continued boldness. God, I pray, God, for any division that the enemy would desire to rise up, Lord God, that it would be snuffed out even in this moment. There would be such a unity in this place. There would be such a, a desire for holiness and purity in this place, Lord God, that they would see this house filled with even many more young people coming to know God as these altars, I believe, are going to be filled as weeping is going to take place, God, just for repentance, God, for more of the Holy Spirit's leading, God, in lives. I pray, God, for there to be revival that begins to break out, Lord God, just, God, that would overflow, God, and not just from this church, but into, into the communities, into homes, Lord Jesus. There would be revivals breaking out in homes, Lord God, of people that are in this church, Lord God. I pray for baptisms in the Holy Spirit, Lord God, that would take out, take place, Lord God, even as people are walking into this building, as they're going and traveling, Lord, that they would be so full of you, Lord God, that it would just impact the world in which they live, God, even here in Three Springs. I thank you for Pastor Dusty. I thank you for Bridget. I thank you for his family. Lord, I pray you'd continue to put a hedge of protection around him, God, and their fam, their home, Lord Jesus. God, I Fan that flame of boldness, Lord Jesus, to preach unapologetically the word of God. God, let these doors be packed out. 
not to expand a personal kingdom, but to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, and all of God's people said amen Amen. and amen. God bless you. It's been an honor to be with you today, and I'm handing it back to Pastor Dusty. Actually, could you just stay? Could you just stay? We're going to pray over these boxes here. Uh, could, could someone run and get the kids? Can someone do that for me? You'll go get them. Tell them quickly. Don't, don't worry about what they're doing. We can clean that up later. Can someone get Bridget? And, uh, please come, Pastor Denny. Girls, my girls, <laughs> come here, please. You know, this, these are love gifts from, from you all, from y'all, however you want to say it. Use, yins, depending on what part of the state we're in. What's that? All preschoolers, good. If you got preschoolers, can you grab your kids, please? Uh, these are love gifts from us, but this is not just about having something to open up on a Sunday or on a Christmas morning. This is about the love of Christ because in every one of these, you know, these are nice gifts, but there's a, there's an invitation to know Jesus in every single box. And, And that's really what this is all about. This is not about us doing something great. And so that we can be great humanitarians. All of this is just to say that Jesus loves you, we love you, God loves you, and we want you in the kingdom. That's what all of this is about. And so these are seeds. These are not just presents. They are seeds. And so I, I want to ask you to continue to pray, uh, even after that they're delivered, that they will continue to grow wherever they... I mean, we have no idea where they're going to end up. We have no idea the homes. And, you know, and someday, I, I, I keep saying this, someday it's going to be a glorious reunion in heaven. And, and I, I know we're going to meet people that we never knew we touched. And that's enough to make my heart just jump. And it's enough to make my heart happy. But I, I asked Pastor Denny to come because I'd like for you to pray over these, Pastor Denny. I'd like for you to lead us in a prayer over these. And, and Bridget, is she handy? Can you come over here, please? And we, we do covet your prayers because it's three... 30 hours, 2,000 miles driving that we're going to be doing, uh, that I'm probably going to be doing. So, so we covered your prayers, uh, and we asked, as often as God pricks your heart, would you please pray for us and pray over these boxes? Pastor Denny, would you please? Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you strengthen this family and this pastor with your might, the same might that rested upon Samson to destroy the Philistines. Let that might rest on Pastor Dusty and this family. Father, I pray that the word of God that's hidden in his heart, and in Bridget's heart and in the girl's heart, Father God, it'll, it'll surface as they speak. Father, I pray for the anointing, the same anointing that's upon your word, to be upon this family as they drive, as they minister, as they give of themselves. Father, let the anointing that's on your word be upon them, that even when they say hello to somebody, people will feel the presence of God. Father, I thank you, God, that you've placed Pastor Dusty and Bridget here. I thank you, Father God, for their obedience. Most of all, for, for their obedience, God. And, and everything else after the obedience is overflow. And what a blessing. 
So, Father, continue to bless them, I pray, in Jesus' name. And, Father, as we pray over these seeds, God, as they grow, as the seeds grow in the lives of people, young people and, and adults, families, as these seeds grow in families, Father, even as the wind blows, Father, if they keep their eyes on the sun, they'll be raised up in the last day. Father, we, we, we seek a harvest of souls. We seek a harvest of, of believers. We, we seek a harvest of mighty men and women to be raised up in our region, in the state, and in the world. Father, use, use these seeds. God, I pray to reach many people and to feed many people the Word of God. Father, I thank you for Pastor Jess and just ask you, God, to bless her as she brought your Word, a timely Word, for this season and for this congregation. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to live in this day and God, use us as mighty warriors to be watchmen over our communities, over our job places. Give us strength, give us power, give us boldness, give us Holy Spirit that we will walk in power, talk in power, and cause many people to come to the knowledge of who Jesus is the mighty Savior of our spirits and the Savior of our souls. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Father God, for a hunger and that you're placing in everybody. Touch everybody. Somebody touch everybody. Everybody right now, touch everybody. God, for the hunger, the appetite, for the appetite of spiritual things, for the appetite of reading your word, set, setting off time to set our eyes in the word of God and get revelation from Holy Spirit. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yep. All right. Praise God. You are dismissed. Uh, we're going to the Salatillo Community Building for our Christmas banquet. Party, the girls are saying party, party. Uh, so we're gonna try, we're gonna try to be eating by no later than noon. So don't take an entire hour to get there, but let's get there quickly. So, all right. Thank you very much. We'll see you over there. Thanks again for joining us today. I pray that this message has touched you and helped you to grow. I want to take a moment right now and I want to encourage you. If you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I want you to do so right now. Or maybe you're the person who says, I've made Jesus my Lord once, but I've fallen away from him. I've lost my first love. I want to encourage you, get right with God right now. We don't have much time left on this earth. Jesus is coming back and I'm going to make sure that you're ready when he does. I want to lead you in a prayer. It's very simple. I want you to say, Father, I am a sinner. I know that I'm destined for hell. The Bible says if you confess Jesus as Lord and believe it in your heart, you'll be saved. So say this, say, Jesus, I confess that you are my Lord and my Savior. And the days that I have left on this earth, I commit to serving you with all that I am. Thank you, Father, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for being the sacrifice for me. Amen. And if you've done that, you are saved. And if you meant that in your heart, you're saved. And I want to encourage you, reach out to us here at the church. Our number is 814-448-9545. Or you can find us on social media. You can find us on our website. I want to encourage you, reach out and let us know if you've made a commitment to Christ today. We want to be able to help disciple you and grow you in the kingdom of God. Again, I hope this helped you today. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.